Ladies and gentlemen, if you could please stand for the Zoning Subcommittee. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to take a roll call. Well, roll call of the members of the Zoning Subcommittee, Councilor Morabito. Here. Here, Councilor Patch. Here. Here, Councilor Rizzo. Here. Here, Councilor Zambudo. Here. Here, Council President Janino. Here. Here, and Chairman Rotundo. Present. Here, quorum is present. Thank you. Uh, this meeting is, uh, again, to go over the uh, project on Suffolk Downs. Uh, quite frankly, uh, the uh, developer of HYM, uh, Mr. O'Brien, has done a great job of uh, presenting uh, his case to the community. Uh, sadly, over the weekend, I had the opportunity to go door to door and actually the, the local coffee shops and found that there was a, a great many people who, quite frankly, didn't understand what was going on. And that was a real shock to me. And uh, I'm very lucky that Mr. O'Brien has obliged me to go over the project one more time. And obviously, uh, some people may or may not ask questions. I know I will. Um, uh, but uh, with that said, uh, I wouldn't mind just going over the basics of the project and just uh, exactly uh, what you project as far as jobs, what you project as far as um, uh, revenue for the city, and more importantly, uh, housing and things of that nature. And uh, I can either do it by asking questions or you can present in a, whatever manner you please. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'm happy to, to do that. We brought some presentation material. I'm, I'm happy to go through that if you'd like uh, today. Um, you know, I've presented a number of times before the council. If I could just maybe begin with a statement, is that okay? Uh, Perfectly uh, fine. Okay. So um, I, I would say just at the outset, so again, my name is Tom O'Brien. I'm uh, with the HYM Investment Group. I'm here with my partner, Doug Manns, and um, a couple of other members of the HYM team. We, you know, as I say, we brought uh, some presentation materials here. But as we've done this presentation now a number of time, times before the city council, I wasn't sure what we should, you know, uh, make available right from the very beginning. If I could, though, Councilor, just to start, um, I've been doing this work for uh, over 25 years. I'm, I'm hesitant to say. I think it's actually 28 years, if you can believe it. Um, and I, you know, I've been through a number of these processes, and I will tell you that this process is one of the best structured that I've ever been involved in. Um, we've really uh, been able to engage with the community in a very uh, good and strong and and, uh, and and frank way in which we've been able to improve our project. Um, if I could just, you know, for a moment, take on uh, a little bit of a list uh, for in terms of meetings and notices. We've been before the city council seven times, if I include tonight, and then our expected appearance on Monday the 26th. Uh, and each time those, uh, those city council meetings and hearings have been uh, posted on the Revere website and have been on Revere TV, as you as you well know. All those public uh, those notices are published in the Revere Journal, uh, and when there are public hearings, they're also published in the Boston Herald, the Revere website, Revere TV, all those things. We've also, as you know, um, through the the good offices of the mayor's office and Bob O'Brien, who's here with us, who's the head of economic development for the mayor, uh, we've done uh, a series of design advisory group meetings, which is a structure that allowed us to get together with a, a number of community leaders from a variety of different. Um, um, you know, positions within the community, people who were former school superintendents to people who ran nonprofits to people who lived in the Beachmont uh, neighborhood all across the, the city, including members of the city council. I believe, Councilor, you were invited to be a part of that as well. Uh, that design advisory group um, met a total of seven times uh, with a focus on key topics across the, uh, the, the project, including the program of the project, the mix of uses, phasing, open space, transportation. I think we did two meetings on transportation, actually, and resiliency. Each one of those meetings was noticed on the Revere website uh, and rebroadcast on Revere TV for all those, those meetings. So if you missed the meeting, uh, you would see my ugly face on Revere TV. Uh, I don't know how many times they would rebroadcast it uh, as well. We did also, as part of that process, we did one larger community uh, public meeting, uh, which was done on August uh, on October 24th. That too was published on the front page of the Revere Journal, uh, and we uh, again was published on the, the Revere website. We've also done one-on-one -on -one council meetings. I don't know how many times we've done these with each of the members of the council. Uh, we've enjoyed these and has given us a chance to uh, gain some, you know, good insight and good feedback from each of you. Uh, each of you, I think, we've met with a number of times, and and I really appreciate that. You've, you've been very kind with your time with us. 
There was also what's called a project review board meeting, which involved city staff. And these were city staffers from the, the head of DPW to the chief of police to the fire chief to you know, a variety of other uh, city professionals. And there were a total of seven of these meetings on the same topic area across uh, the board each week before we did those um, DAG meetings, those, uh, those um, uh, de development advisory group meetings as well. And each of those uh, meetings had material that was produced uh, that was published uh, on our site. All these materials were published on our site. Again, SuffolkDownsRedevelopment.com. That's you can find any of these these pieces available on that site. Um, and then, of course, we've also done numerous other one-on-one -on -one meetings with Revere DPW, uh, the planning staff here in the uh, uh, city hall, the mayor's office, neighborhood stakeholders, business owners. As I think I've said before, um, you know, Councillor, between uh, Revere and, and East Boston, when I total up all of the public meetings and stakeholder meetings that we've done in the last 18 months, we've had over 350 different meetings. So we're really proud of the, the process. But for a moment, if I could, um, Councillor, um, knowing that this process has gone well, in particular in Revere, and frankly, we're ahead in Revere than where we are in the Boston process, just given how the pro Boston process works, we've committed that the first phase of this project will be at Beachmont in Revere. So our first phase will be in Revere, and we're anxious to begin that as soon as we can. But if I could, just uh, a little bit on, on that, uh, Councillor. So we want to begin that process as soon as possible, but there's a lot of work in front of us before we can actually break ground. So we want to get through this process with you this month, with the council uh, this month, uh, so that we can then um, uh, firmly engage with the, the architects so that we can advance um, the planning for the first buildings here, because we still need to come back before the city on each of those first uh, buildings for uh, a specific design um, uh, review and site review within the, the next part of our process. So each of the buildings will go through a site review process with city staff, which we hope to accomplish in the first half of 2019, all the while, we'll be advancing drawings and doing the work necessary to put ourselves in position to begin the project in 2019. But as I said, uh, Councillor, we really we want to begin it as soon as possible, which is why these meetings are so important. We appreciate your time to uh, to help us complete this this process. So, uh, if I could uh, just complete this portion of it, just by requesting that we stay on track with uh, the schedule that we've you know collectively established here. We appreciate your time here tonight, uh, but we're uh, obviously hoping that there's a uh, a positive vote coming out of this subcommittee so that we can stay on track for the City Council and a vote on the 26th, uh, which will be next Monday after Thanksgiving. Thank you. Um, I acknowledge the uh, 350 meetings that you had. It's about a meeting a, a day, to be quite honest with you. Doug, and I, about, have, like Doug a, and I have not seen our spouses very it's often. It's a significant they're, amount they're, of they're meetings. We have bunk beds at Suffolk Downs just sleeping, you know, um, sleeping in either corner. You know, one of the things that you uh, state, and, and I, I really want to point out, is that, you know, looking at your project dates that I've reviewed, uh, May 18th, the 16th, 30th, June 13th, June 27th, uh, July 18th. I've actually reviewed these online. I've seen the ones that uh, are online, shall I say, as well as the DAG meetings from June 6th, 20th, one of them that I attended, and I had to relinquish myself from that committee due to health reasons. Um, but that said, much of what you're telling me, uh, I, I appreciate, and you're talking about how it's, uh, uh, that you met with many of the people, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, the councilors one-on-one, -on -one, many of the people within government one-on-one, -on -one. And that kind of creates an echo chamber. You feed into itself, it's, it's particularly those people within government. My concern, and what has been echoed to me from people throughout the city, is that they don't really know what's going on down there. Some of them have mixed ideas of what's going on down there. Some of them have misinformation. Part of me actually having tonight is to make sure that they don't have mixed information, because unlike any other project in the history of the state, more importantly for Matt, for, for, for Revere, this is a project in which you're going to have 13,000 units possibly down at Suffolk Downs proper. No, that's not correct. Uh, well, Mr. what you Chairman, have, what, what you have voter, reported. Please, it's, point of order. Uh, I'm speaking. No. Well, you know, you have other people on the committee here that want to talk. They're raising their hands, and you have I, taken over the whole respect, meeting. Uh, Councillor. Um, you know, this isn't a meeting one-on-one -on -one with you and the uh, HYM. There's a whole committee here to deal Councilor, with Councillor, thank you for your, your, so, your time. Believe it or not, you're not a... You know, it doesn't matter. I'm still, a, I'm still a moment. member here at the city council. If you're sir. going to continue to interrupt me and well, be rude, I hope you understand. You. you feel feel like it's it's been happening before that you don't do it to um, other people. Thank you, councillor. I appreciate your time. And just so you know, the uh, council president would like to speak. Uh, thank you, councillor. Um, but with that said, this is uh, going to be one of the largest projects. I'm reading from what was uh, put in these notes that I have here. I'm just going by that. 
Now, if there's not going to be 13,000 proposed units there, then so be it, but it's going to be one of the larger uh, projects within the city's history in which you're going to have a substantial amount of units next to our community. Matter of fact, uh, a, a foot away. Part of so there's 26,000 uh, units collectively in the city right now. Whatever you put there above and beyond the 3,000 is going to be a significant impact. With that said, that's part of the reason why I'm asking you to come today. Does anybody wish to speak? Council President. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to be, I'll be very brief. First, I just wanted to acknowledge my colleague, Councillor McKenna, who's the ward councillor primarily impacted by this. She's ill and was unable to attend this evening, so we wish her well, but I know that uh, she definitely wanted to be here, so I wanted to just say that quickly. Um, and she's also been a part of all the meetings, you know, thus far. Um, on my own behalf, I've had the opportunity as council president to chair many meetings with your organization, see many PowerPoints, very detailed presentations with many questions from the community and other people that are involved. Um, I'm happy to say that I feel as if you represented your organization well and uh, provided a great resource to the city. I have not heard many concerns or questions in any of that I have. I was able to reach out to you and received answers very quickly to address any issues. I'm in support of the project, and I look forward to seeing the beginning of the development in the Beachmont area. Thank you. Does any member of the com committee would like to speak? Uh, Dan? Council Zambudo? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I've ever seen a developer more transparent than this group in my 20 years on the city council. So I'm not looking for that. I'm just stating facts here. Uh, I'm completely comfortable with this project. Um, I've said many times how lucky we are to have this group developing this major site and this major piece of our city, uh, I'm, I'm very comfortable that it's in their hands because, not because I happen to like this gentleman, he's an honest, forthright individual, but because their reputation precedes them. Uh, their stellar reputation precedes them. Uh, I've been through a lot of this. I can't say that I've been to the 350 meetings. I've been to several meetings. I've been to seven meetings here at the city council. Uh, I've been to a couple of the uh, DAG meetings, and uh, although I'm not on that committee, um, I'm completely comfortable. I'm thrilled that Revere is going to kick off this project, and I, I think that means the, I think you call it an innovation building, is that? That's correct, Councilor. And that's yes. going to be the first piece of this thing? In fact, we spent a, a $50 million investment from this group in the city of Revere, on spec, I might add. So uh, I, I couldn't be more thrilled, I couldn't be more in support of a project, uh, and more comfortable with a project. So that's where I stand on this. Thank you. Councilor Patch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I want to say that uh, I'm very comfortable uh, the way this uh, project has been going. Um, there's probably been more meetings with your group than all the meetings combined in my 11 years. Um, so, and I, and I haven't been getting, I've gotten a few, uh, very few negative uh, complaints, but mostly positive. We had a public hearing meeting here uh, the, the other night and uh, uh, there was so, uh, proponents, there was uh, uh, many distinguished people here from the, in the city that spoke and people from Beachmont and uh, all in favor. There was nobody that spoke against it and that was their opportunity uh, to do so. Um, I just want to, uh, would you go over the, uh, the tax, um, how much money we're going to get in tax revenue and how much you're going to be spending for uh, road improvement and uh, plus other stuff in, within the Suffolk Downs. Sure, so the, the property tax amount when completely built out for <clears throat> Revere is $43 million from, uh, from this site, which um, 
I think is at least a 50% increase over the total local property taxes that are um, that are paid currently uh, in review. So it's a significant increase over the current property tax amount. Um, and then for the road improvements, you know, for us, there's uh, probably about if I take all the infrastructure all together, it's probably about $350 million in total that we'll spend on open space roads. That's across the whole site, I, I should say. Uh, uh, roads, open space, uh, all the water and sewer, and all the off-site improvements as well. So as we presented you know, twice before the DAG, then also once before the, the city council, or a couple times before the city council, uh, significant road improvements, including widening 1A, all those things, that, that's $50 million of off-site improvements as well. All right, well, I just, I won't, take much more time. I just, I just want to say that if uh, that'll be a great improvement uh, for the, the citizens of Revere. Um, and if we don't develop Suffolk Downs, uh, right now, right now there's going to be uh, uh, hundreds of apartments built on 1A and 107 in Lynn. Uh, Marlin's putting up another couple of hundred up in Overlook on the Marlin side uh, because they can't build in Revere anymore. Um, uh, so what do we do if you can't develop Suffolk Downs? You make a cow pasture there and there. You're still going to get the traffic going to Lynn, Malden, and uh, all these other pl uh, surrounding cities. So at least we'll, you know, we'll get some improvement in the roadways and we'll get that um, important uh, tax revenue, and uh, I just feel it's a, a plus for the city, and that's why I'll be voting in favor of it. Thank you. Could, could I point out one thing to Councilor Patch, just, just as a reminder for Councilor Patch and for the members of the council, uh, this council was very firm with us right from the very beginning and said that 50% uh, of the site must be devoted to commercial uh, uh, property. And so we've, you know, we've, we've stuck to that. That's what you wanted us, that's what you voted through, that's what you wanted us to do. And that commercial property makes a significant difference in the, in the property tax um, overall overlay that, you'll, that the city will end up with. It's a very important thing. Council Marbido. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as a city councilor, one thing I c that is very reassuring is when a developer comes before you and is able to answer all your questions, answers the phone call on the first ring, doesn't give you the runaround, and that's you. Um, and all we ask, I, I can speak for myself, and I'm sure most of my colleagues would agree that what our constituents want to see is they want to they want to be able to see a developer who is willing to work with their counselor and they want a counselor who can answer their questions and you have been more than willing to work with us on a one-on-one -on -one basis on a group basis and as counselor Zambudo said it's not a matter um, of he mentioned transparency. It's not a matter of transparency being an, illusion, being an illusion and you're creating this illusion that you're everywhere. You are everywhere. You are going from forum to forum. You are on the internet. You are going to schools. Um, and you are being transparent. And I couldn't ask for anything more from a developer. So that's an attestment to you and your team. Each and every one of you have been putting in the work. And I'm actually proud to have a <coughs> grade A de developer. The, this is a team that built the Boston Bruins training facility in Brighton. It's phenomenal if you've ever been in there. And I've seen that building from scratch go up. And I, even when I speak to people, um, when I was in that area working, they were excited, excited about the developers. I've asked contact people. Even before you guys did business with us or wanted to do business at Suffolk Downs, I, I inquired about HYM. I have heard nothing but positive things about this company. And here we are. We, Go forward. And I did the legwork. This day and age, okay, this time in Revere, I've done the legwork, knocked on doors, and asked the people, what are your thoughts on Suffolk Downs? Were there some naysayers? Yeah. Very, very few. Majority were in favor of this project. They were excited. 
A lot of people weren't, didn't care for the gambling. They didn't want the casino. They, I was a proponent of the casino, but I see this as a better road for our future. And I'm glad that you are the developer coming along the road with us. Councilor Powers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. O'Brien, first of all, at the outset, let me thank you so much for being available anytime I did call you. We had sat down, we met, I had some concerns, and you certainly addressed them. And in my opinion, you addressed them in a favorable manner. You know, Councilor Patch alluded to something about the development down in Lynn, along the Linway Inland, in back of the old Charter House and all those uh, facilities down there. That's going to be developed. So do we just sit here and do nothing and let Lynn go by us and over on the GE site, the old Riverworks site and back there? No, we have to take a positive step. You have been more transparent than any previous developer I've ever encountered. I'm going to tell you what scares me. The fact that Amazon is not coming to Revere, or Boston, that scares me. Because you have a piece of property over there, and I know you want to get going. Every day you waste is costing you money. So do we just sit back and delay this to a point where you turn around and say, I've got to start in Boston now, I can't start in Revere? I can't do the plaza over where the stable area is. I can't do the shops and restaurants. I can't do the hotel. I can't do all of those projects that would bring millions of dollars into our tax coffers, okay? Millions of dollars so that we can deal with the growth of this city. Everything's growing. I remember when Revere was 40,000 people. It's not that way anymore. We talked about the uh, station in back of Wonderland. And, and I think you agreed with me that that's a positive thing. And that's something that you were certainly going to promote. And I think it's so important to your project because you can't, you can't develop uh, Suffolk Downs without having transportation for people that live on the North Shore, Peabody, Lynn, Salem, Marblehead, Swampscott, Saugus, I mean, all the way down to Rockport and Gloucester. We need that station. I think the fact that you realized that when we met is important to me, and it's important to the, the residents that I represent down there. So I can tell you this evening unequivocally that I am going to support this project, and I would hope sooner than later. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you want Patrick? Patrick? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if the other committee members, I'm not a committee, committee member, but if they wanted to speak first, or? Everybody spoke uh, okay. uh, on the committee at this point, I think, Dan. Do you want to speak do you next? Wanna, Dan, do you want to go first? You want, After thank, Patrick, please. Thank you, Councilor Rizzo. I appreciate that. Um, I, I'll probably echo a lot of the sentiment from some of my fellow councilors. And uh, obviously, the, uh, I do believe we're going to have a, a very significant, a really great project in, in Riviera and in East Boston. It's going to, people keep asking me, is it going to be separate? And I said, no, it's, we're going to be partnering up with the city of Boston, which I don't think is a bad thing. I think it's a great thing. Um, but I did have some questions, and uh, I, we've spoken you know, a number of times, and you've always answered them very well. And I just wanted to, if you could point out, you know, maybe for some people that don't know, or even, you know, just for everyone's edification, just the impact with, um, in regards to public safety, not so much on the traffic, although uh, you're putting a significant uh, amount of resources in the traffic end, but just how the public safety um, is going to be involved in this project, uh, whether it's, you know, on site or there's going to be some resources dedicated towards ensuring that we have fire and police um, presence in that area in personnel. I'm not, not necessarily saying we should have a substation, considering we have a huge station right, right outside of it. Um, and then the, just one of the other questions, I know that in this day and age we're not here to, uh, city councils aren't going to um, attempt to uh, 
I don't think we can make this uh, a criterion, but if you can just explain to us how you're, you're going to be um, upfront and also open to uh, bringing on responsible labor, uh, that my hopes will impact the Revere uh, workers in Revere that uh, are involved with responsible trade and responsible labor so that we can make sure that they're getting jobs on that site. If you can just bring that up. And Mr. O'Brien, if you could sure. just yeah. let me jump in for a second. Uh, Thank you. Patrick. Um, I guess the question, uh, and correct me, uh, we're hoping that you're going to use union labor for the very simple practice that in Revere, it has a history of hiring Revere people to build Revere uh, products. I understand you might be using Moriarty. Is that possible? So we, for many of our projects, we use uh, John Moriarty and Associates. They've been a contractor for us um, you know, on, on a lot of our different projects, including the next one that we're going to take on in downtown Boston. If we could use Moriarty on this project, we'd love it. I will tell you, quite honestly, you, you know me. I, I don't ever... I'm not going to ever tell you anything, you know, and, and turn around and do something different. So I just want to be really direct with you. Um, these projects, every single one of the projects that are being built, everything that you can think of that's around here has been built with non-union labor. Everything that's been built in the city. Right? That's correct. So, and we compete against those projects. And I will tell you, we're engaged in a very deep discussion right now with the building trades. I've, I've been working with the building trades since uh, 1992. Um, so I've been doing mm -hmm. this for a long, long time. Um, I think we share a deep amount of respect. My, between us and the building trades. Um, and uh, and so we're working closely. If we can put something together that works with the building trades, that still allows us to build these buildings at a cost that makes them competitive, then we're gonna try and do it. But but I again, I don't want, I wanna be really direct with you. We cannot make the numbers, we can't you know kind of pull a rabbit out of the hat and pretend that the numbers have to be what they have to be, which they, they yeah. must be. Yeah. Yeah. What I would like to ask, obviously, I, I'm assuming that you're speaking to the mayor at this level regarding this issue because of market recovery Both and other incentives that you right exactly considering Maddie's position in the past. Um, I would hope that you'd be able to come to some type of agreement, understanding that uh, there are different rates for residential versus commercial. I understand Revere is a different product than Boston. Granted, it's only you know 10 feet away. But uh, for me personally, and I'm sure for many of the councils up here, that is a very, very important aspect because uh, those 15,000 jobs that you're uh, hoping to have uh, permanently and those 7,000 construction jobs that you plan on having, uh, I would really like to see uh, them go to Revere residents. And I can't say uh, wholeheartedly or without reservation that every time that I've had a union involved in a project in the city of Revere, uh, in particular school building projects, they have been very apt to hiring Rivia people. That's our experience. And you are correct. Not a single project has been built union uh, in the past 10 years. Or shall I say past five years. Private project, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, we, we um, there's two different issues that you're raising, Councilor, if I could. Um, hiring Revere people and, you know, uh, uh, thinking through whether it's a union built project. I mean, it's, so we're more than willing, and, and Bob might, might speak to this. We've, we've started a lot of work with Bob O'Brien's office and with the mayor's office, trying to think about how we can um, uh, make sure that we train people who are Revere residents to be prepared both for construction jobs, but even better for uh, permanent jobs. So I don't, I don't want to take some of the thunder that Bob might, might take from that, but, but that's a really important thing for us. Um, and so uh, creating opportunities for Revere residents to both work in the construction trades as well as uh, to work in the permanent jobs on the site is a really you know, important commitment that we've already made as part of the, the process. The question of the trades unions is a, is a different question. Um, but as I said, we are engaged in a process right now to see if we can end up at a place that allows us to build these buildings at a cost that we must get to. We have to, the, these buildings are not economic. In other words, just to, again, if I could put a finer point on it, the tower that we're building in downtown Boston right now, the residential tower that we're building at Bullfinch Crossing, the cost of that is about $750 per foot. Okay, that's a big number. That means each of the units costs, you know, close to a million bucks just to build them, okay, each, each unit. Now, now, we can do that downtown because the rents downtown warrant it, the condo prices warrant it, but we're not in downtown Boston, right? So the, all these buildings have been built non-union because the rents and the condo prices, you know, match up with that, unfortunately. So we can't end up in, in, in a, a non-economic position but still, we are who we are, which is we're committed to, to building these projects right. We're committed to try and make this work. And we're deep into a process with the building trades unions to see if we can uh, get to a number that works. Uh, when you talk about the numbers, and if the council would uh, uh, allow me, uh, 
my understanding is $947 million uh, assessed value from what I have here in your executive summary for the 3,000 units. Um, I think it's on page uh, six, if I'm not mistaken. These are your numbers. Um, so I would assume that they're correct. Yeah, if you're looking at, we did a study, if that's the study that we did, yeah. Yeah, so that we did a study with RKG, which um, is an entity that does this kind of work. So the purpose of that study was to um, uh, project, you know, to, to look at the built environment, right? right? So that would, that would mean $308 per unit without knowing what square footage you have. So currently the, 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 currently the stick that. built comparables in the city of Riviera uh, is anywhere between 100 uh, square foot to 200, depending on where you want to be. But the seal the price is anywhere between uh, 250 to 400, again, depending on location. But that's the assessed value, which doesn't always Correct. have a direct it's relationship different than what to either the comparable. cost, nor does it have a relationship to the market value, right? I mean, it's, there's, there's, there's three different values. There's three different numbers that you're talking about there. Correct. The cost to build it, the assessed value, mm -hmm. and the market value are three right. different numbers. The so market value is generally always higher than the assessed. Always, yeah, in Massachusetts. because you can't fund yeah. a, you cannot get any uh, mortgage off of it. You can't fund it. Yeah, it's just the nature of how the assessment works. With yeah. that said, um, Councilor, uh, just just the, the last point on the, in regards to public safety. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. So on the public safety, we, we spent uh, first of all um, the police chief, the fire chief have been very kind with their time. Um, in fact, um, each of them participated in the uh, in the project review board that you know that we uh, um, uh, you know have been meeting with seven times over the course of the last you know few months. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say in particular, uh, just if I were to pick out some issues, the chief was very helpful with us on that RKG uh, process to understand what the, uh, what the staffing you know, uh, needs would be for him over time. Obviously, we're fortunate in that the police headquarters, a beautiful brand new police headquarters is right next door to us. So, we're, so I think he's good from a facility standpoint, but we went through uh, his staffing uh, requirements over, over time. And he was also very kind with us on transportation related issues, particularly going through uh, his specific knowledge of where there are issues with traffic, where there are issues with safety, which is a big, you know, big, big thing. He spent time and his team spent time with us as we walked specific intersections to think about safety. The fire chief, same thing. I would say among the issues that I can recall that the fire chief, um, you know, worked with us on is is making sure that there's better access for the fire vehicles coming out of the um, uh, the firehouse. You know, again on Winter Path. So both professionals have been great with us, and we've tried to account for those and. You know, in all of our work, I'm looking at Doug. If I've missed anything, um, if you think of it. One of the other things we talked about too is that we obviously are going to be providing uh, rack security. Sir, I, I really hate to bother you, so the public can hear what you're saying. Thank you. A um, <clears throat> couple of the quick things too is um, Doug Manns from the HYM Investment Group. All of our buildings have 24/7 on-site private security. We also have roving. That still means Revere Police will still be responding to incidents, but these are professionally managed buildings, so the load should be lighter. Also, all new buildings that are built are to full code compliance, so there should be less calls in terms of just the age of the buildings. Um, so there are definitely benefits from this that should mean that there's less burden on the city of Revere, but we still assume with our analysis that was up that, you know, it was 43 million of gross tax revenues, net 30 million tax revenue after you control for all the expenses to the city of Revere. So that's a net new $30 million of tax revenue coming to the city of Revere that is unallocated to any division or department. So, um, which is a pretty uh, solid uh, benefit for the city of Revere. And that's based on the assessed $947 million of residential property. Correct. And then also remember, there's also um, a commercial assessment. 1.2 uh, billion is what you have in your paper. Correct. Thanks, Councilor. Councilor Rizzo and Ira, after him. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, I do have some questions, but first off, just some comments and some thoughts. Um, first off, I obviously want to thank the uh, Suffolk Downs Development Ad Advisory Group. I know they didn't go to 350 meetings, but I'm sure they went to a lion's share. I, I used to get the invitations or I received invitations uh, by email, and, uh, but I always found it more productive, uh, not just here, not just up here as a counselor, but in our private meetings that we've been able to have. And you've been more than generous with your time and all of the accolades that you have received from members of the council, members from the development advisory group and others are very well deserved. Um, as a city councilor, though, I have to, uh, and somebody that's been, you know, involved in, in local government and uh, involved in 
some significant projects. You know, it, I do recognize that it does make sense sometimes for a developer to diminish some of the downsides to, you know, have that type of return that you're looking for. And of course, it's got to be win-win. It can't just be win for the city and lose for the developer. So, um, you know, and I recognize that. I recognize that. But I think it's important for me to point out or at least ask questions about how we're going to diminish the downside um, and mitigate as much as we can uh, and uh, maximize the upside from the city's standpoint. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, you know, it's interesting to me as somebody who was at the other side of that podium just a couple years ago, some, and I'm not saying every member of the city council, but 300 units were proposed at the Shaw site. There was pandemonium up here. There was people in the crowd yelling and screaming. This was the worst thing ever to happen. It takes me an hour to get from the beach to Broadway. And, you know, uh, you know, now we're talking about a total of 10,000 plus apartments on that site, not like 3,000 in Revere, just across the street from where 300 was proposed, but now 3,000 over there and another seven or 7,500 or whatever in, you know, in Boston, clearly there's gonna be impacts there. And there was so much of an outrage in this community just a couple years ago about residential development that, uh, you know, and I was hearing it loud and clear, I had asked the city council to impose a two year moratorium so we could undertake a, pro a process that at that time we called Plan Revere, it was in conjunction with MAPC, and um, we, were, we were on our way. It was only a couple of months into it, and unfortunately that was disbanded, but we were looking at creating safeguards and looking at our overall zoning to protect the city from you know, uh, projects that maybe weren't as beneficial to the residents that are already living here now. Um, and so, but unfortunately, that went by the books and that went by the way, and now we're dealing with this, uh, which is great. And let me just say this. There's a lot of aspects of this project that I do like, okay? Um, I've, I haven't made it any secret that the number of residential units is a little unnerving to me and what kind of impacts that's going to have in many different areas, not just traffic, because, you know, we hear traffic, traffic, traffic all the time. You could... You could build anything and people are going to be concerned. And if you just drive through the streets of Revere just over the last few years, you will see a significant increase in at least what I think and what many others that I speak to think is, um, you know, a problem really is, a, you know, being a cut through city from the city of Boston to the North Shore and then adding all these different units. Um, you know, just what we have, you know, notwithstanding the 3,000 units that you're proposing here at Suffolk Downs, we've got about 1,400 in, in, you know, in the works right now. We've got, as I mentioned, the Shaw site, there's 330 total units there, pot hotel, pot, pot apartments. We've got 75 units at 60 Ocean Ave, 200 units at 20 Revere Beach Boulevard, 305 units currently underway at Parcel H. We've got 148 units at the old site of Bianchi's Pizza, uh, right next door to the St. George. We've got 54 affordable housing units now being proposed, I'm not sure where it's at, at the old Cove site, right at the end of Revere Street, major traffic problem already, without traffic coming in and out of that site. Another 190 to 200 units on Lot 2 of water, Waterfront Square, and another close to 200 units uh, at the D'Amico property. Um, we've got uh, the Lasden property, which you're probably not familiar with, nor should you be, but that's on Revere Beach Boulevard next to Beach House, and I'm told they're proposing 200 to 275 more residential units there. So we, at the city right now, I feel like, is being overrun with residential, much of it non-owner occupied residential, um, that puts a little fear in me. I mean, we had one little project down on Ocean Avenue um, that was built as condos, and when the economy took a downturn, it became just about 100% affordable housing, and people were outraged, and they were upset, and you still hear people talking about it today. I think that could be the driving force of why people were so upset over the proposal of 300 units 
uh, across the street from where your project is over at the Shaw site because they were fearful about what could happen in a downturn of the economy. And it seems as though every time you put on the television or the radio, you're hearing these pundits and experts saying, oh, we're due for a downturn, we're due for a correction, we're due for this. That does concern me. Um, the stress on our water sewer system, the stress on our public safety that we talked about, uh, you know, the public works, you, you know, just to keep up with our consent decree that we currently have right now that was imposed on us by the Department of Justice is costing millions and millions and millions of dollars just to cure the, pro the problems that we currently already have. So I have some major reservations about the, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the residential component. Um, but that being said, I, I, you know, I have some specific questions that I would like to ask. Um, and the first one, I actually didn't jot it down, but while it's on my mind, um, it goes without saying, Tom, and I have this gut feeling about you and your organization, as others do, that you stand behind what you say. And, you know, but we don't always know. I mean, will Tom O'Brien always be here? Or will Tom O'Brien, you know, I mean, things happen in life. We don't know what happens. So, I mean, we've seen, you know, the Wonderland uh, T-Station project that spans all the way down Ocean Avenue. We've seen those projects flip, you know, as an example. We were promised a commercial component down there. We still have zero. This is 15 years into that agreement with them. Zero. Um, we were promised all union labor down there. We have zero union labor down there. The, pro the property was flipped, and the people who were buying it decided that it wasn't in their best interest to use union labor. So, you know, while a lot of us up here voted for a project, largely, I remember, because of that provision that union labor would be used, there wasn't any part of that project so far that has used union labor. So, you know, you can understand my paranoia when it comes to, um, you know, having things in writing. Now, as I read through, and I did do a lot of uh, reading through the uh, voluminous uh, uh, proposal that you submitted to the City Council, and I, um, admittedly I didn't read every page, but I did read portions that were important to me to get to know and understand a little bit. And, um, you know, uh, is there, is this proposal, you know, is this proposal that, you know, goes through four phases, is this all in writing, contractual, like this is what the city is getting, period. There's no deviation from that. This is what the city is receiving. Yeah, there's a very detailed uh, decision document that has been negotiated with um, the city staff uh, that I believe was submitted with the with the vote, right? Yeah. So that so that is before you, uh, Councillor, um, and that's a you know multi. I don't know how many pages. 20, 25 pages. What longer? Yeah. Are yeah, there it's longer? Uh, that's Are submitted they, with you, very detailed um, uh, as well, which we've spent a lot of time negotiating with city staff to go through. And there's and performance these, provisions in there. There are timelines. There are uh, penalties if each, things aren't done. I mean, I would imagine, is that the case in this document? Each phase is delineated and, and worked through. We've spent a lot of time with, with Frank Stringy and our attorneys. We, we spent a lot of time, I, I would say a couple months at least, going through the detail of, of that document, yes. Okay. Because, you know, um, you know, it's that old definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And that's something I really don't want to see with a project of this magnitude uh, like we have in the past with other projects that we've undertaken and been promised. You know, we're still waiting for the Route 1 Diamond Interchange up at uh, Lynn Street from the Overlook Ridge project. That's 15 years in the making. I'm sure that's not even on the drawing board anymore. So a lot of these transportation plans, I want to make sure these are all signed and sealed and well, remember, soon to be delivered. Yeah, remember the detail around each phase and what we're obligated to do at each phase, whether it's open space or the build out of the plaza or, you know, each of the buildings or the transportation improvements, all those things are in that, that decision document. In addition to that, remember, we will have 
a MEPA decision document the state with the state that will also define the transportation improvements that we must make at different stages of as we develop it. You know, measured in part by the amount of square footage that we'll you know we'll be taking on. So we'll we'll get to certain amounts and we'll have to do the next level of transportation improvements or you know whatever needs to happen next. All the parks, if I could just on the water and sewer, just just as you know, we spend a lot of time with the Department of Public Works here, but we've also spent a lot of time with Boston Water and Sewer and with the Mass Water Resources Authority to, to go through a very detailed plan for how we'll uh, make connection with the sewer. I will tell you from a sewer perspective, in the permanent build out, all of the sewer for this site will go through the Boston system. So the, the city reviewer will not be burdened by, by that sewer. Uh, that's all gonna go through the Boston system. So you know we've gone through in detail all of this and, and spent, you, you are, I, I know I don't need to tell you this counselor, but you are fortunate to have a very good, strong group of professionals who represent the city who've been uh, very forthright with us in terms of what the city's needs are and we feel uh, that you know we've, we've come up with a good plan on a lot of these different topics that you raise. So that was a great segue into my first question. Mr. Chairman, if I may now, just I have some questions. Of course. Um, uh, in phase one, the Revere Project site will require an interim connection to the existing City of Revere 20-inch sewer main adjacent to the police station. Water and sewer questions go to my partner, Doug Mans. Oh, okay. Just for a moment. So there's going to be an interim connection with the City of Revere, correct? That is correct. That is proposed. Okay, now this interim connection will be discontinued once the MWRA um, bypass line is constructed uh, that I believe is going to run out toward Bennington Street, correct? Is that where it ultimately is going to go? Correct. It's going to go through the site out to right, you know, where Wally Street and Suffolk Down Station is, and then it goes right. through the Boston Streets down to the direct connection to the MWRA system. Okay, now this tie-in, do you anticipate how long this interim connection is going to be there before the full implementation is of the MWRA bypass? So based upon the current schedule of about 15 to 20 years, it's probably about a five year um, process. So for five years, we will be using a Revere sewer line, correct? Correct, and again, we are required to pay I&I &I fees or inflow and infiltration fees to the city of Revere. Correct. To offset what we're putting in, so it's a 10 to one mitigation rate. So for every gallon of sewer that goes in, even in the interim, that goes into the city of Revere system, 10 gallons of what we call is like the storm water that's getting into the sewer system has to come out. So we have to actually create Well, that the payment, capacity. I'm sorry, Doug, I don't yep. mean to cut you up, but yep. just while my train of thought is going, like, so the payment, the payment's great. And I don't know if that's gonna lead to more work that the city's gonna have to spend to, to, to maintain it. I'm just more concerned what kind of an impact that's gonna have to, uh, again, my concern right now uh, stands with existing residents here. So how will we be impacted by the first five years of this project using an existing sewer line? You know, have we, have we figured out what kind of impact that's going to have on current residents that, you know, a lot of people in this city, I hate to say it, but unfortunately because of the uh, topography of the city and because of the uh, the nature of the what I think has been, you know, in a lot of areas has been overbuilt. People are suffering with a lot of flooding during high rain events and high water events. So, like, I'm a little concerned that for five years, that extra from however many thousands of units are going to be built are going to be dumped into an existing sewer line. And I just want to be sure that 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 has been accounted for uh, by our water sewer professionals so that people are not going to be negatively impacted by this because that's my biggest concern. I think, you know, you guys have a lot of talent in your group and I, 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 you know, I have high hopes for this project and certainly the revenue is not something to sneeze at. That's something that the city could absolutely use. But you've got to weigh how much money that the city gets versus what's the quality of life for our residents. And that's always been my concern. You know, I mean, like, I'd love to sit here and throw bouquets and keep throwing and talking about how wonderful everything is, but there, I believe that we have some real issues here that need to be ironed out and talked about and well thought out before we just say, hey, it's been a transparent process, you guys are great, and let's just go with it. Like, that, that's just not how I operate, and I can't operate that way. I wouldn't sit here if that's the way that it was. So I just want to be sure that, that this water sewer uh, problem is, um, is, is or, or this water sewer situation mm -hmm. is addressed and that there will be no negative impacts to existing residents. 
Very valid question, Counselor, and <clears throat> something that we're very, very familiar with. You know CDM Smith worked for the city for the uh, consent decree. We have a complete sewer model of our system. We're modeling the impact that this development will have on an interim basis on our system. And <clears throat> based on that model, HYM will be responsible for upgrading our system uh, so there'll be no impacts at all to the existing system. Now, they, it's on their dime. If the II fee that they're required to pay uh, is not enough, they will, they will do the improvements it takes, and that'll be outlined in the land development, project development agreement that is included in the special permit conditions that you have. So this is something I'm uh, very knowledgeable about. We worked with the casino on this. At that time, we were talking about a, an additional sewer line uh, to have two sewer lines going into our main 36-inch uh, line on, Har on uh, River Beach Parkway. If it takes that, they'll do that, and it'll improve our system. When they, when they disconnect, we'll have the improvements still there. So even though they're going to take all their flow and put it to Boston, we'll reap the benefits of the improvements that they're putting into the system on an interim basis. Okay, so okay, so are you saying that this? Got, my understanding. I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, but this, I think this is a, a very important yes, issue is. for people when it comes to when it comes to this issue. Um, so, are you saying? My understanding when I read it was that the sewer from the site was going into an existing line. It said nothing about an additional line. Are you saying there's going to be an additional line there? If it takes uh, increasing the capacity of that line. Well, how they, we know that? It. Well, that's when we're going to run the soil model. And the soil model indicate what improvements have to be undertake, undertaken uh, to handle So this really flow. hasn't been ironed out yet, then? No. No, it's part of the pro it'll be part of the project development agreement. Uh, I'm excuse me I can I tell you that we need a new soil line on Elliott Road all the way up to North Shore Road. There's a lot of infiltration coming into that soil line. Just by replacing and upgrading that soil line may show us that there's a, there's a benefit uh, not only to the city, uh, but to this development, and there'll be no, no impacts to the city as a result of the upgrading that sewer line. But we need to have that proof in the model to show us that. Okay. Um, All right. I'm, I'm Frank, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Um, my understanding, and obviously someone from H1 can answer this, uh, looking at the uh, Boston uh, BP, uh, BA. Uh, my understanding is that you're going to be also utilizing a 12-inch main over there too on the Boston side. Is that correct? At least that's what it says here, if I'm not reading it correctly. Yeah, so there's also potentially an interim connection to the city of Boston mm -hmm. that we use for the first phase two as well. Until we oh, this is phase one. Yeah, for phase one, yeah, for the city right. of Boston. So using one of their existing lines too as well, we have the same I and I mitigation requirement. So again, think about this way. For every gallon of new sanitary we add into the city of Boston line, we're taking out four gallons of infill and infiltration, which mm -hmm. means it's a net add. There's three other sure. gallons of additional capacity in that line for them. And then we build the bypass line that goes directly to the MWA system, and all the interim connections get turned over to that permanent connection, which, again, as Frank said, that leaves existing or existing capacity in those lines back to both cities. Thank you. Uh, okay, just a – oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. O'Brien, if you could come to the podium, i got a question for you, sir. What type of linkage money are we going to be having for this project? There's not uh, direct linkage payments uh, on this project. Uh, so Boston are. is getting 3.414 uh, in linkage funding for the housing and job linkage of 699. We're getting nothing? Well, on the, uh, the, same, uh, res the same preference for uh, Boston residents on employment and contracting opportunities will also No, no, this is review. a direct payment that I just read off of the, uh, yeah. the BP, uh, BA site. So we, what are we getting in mitigation? We're getting the Nothing. benefit of all of the investment that is being made, all of the he roadways and green space. And so that's he has part. to do that. That's well, he has to do it. Correct. Has to Mr. do that. Mr. O'Brien has to do that as a result of the agreements that have been reached with the city and the city council. But there's no mitigation. There is no separate payment for mitigation if, funds well, beyond if, the hundreds of millions of dollars that are being invested. Correct. Thank you. If you could correct me, Mr. O'Brien, please. Hey, Councillor. So, um, you know, beginning in the, the early to mid-1980s, the City of Boston has a, 
um, a, a policy that is, is enshrined in basically in city law that makes it so that uh, any developer who wants to build a commercial project in Boston must make linkage payments to the city of Boston. I would invite this, this council to consider that kind of a process. The city of Boston did that in 1983 or 1984, I forget when they did that. Uh, so it's been a long established process in the city of Boston. Revere does not have that, that kind of a process. Um, instead though, we have however, Councillor, I would say, it is not true to say that there's no mitigation. I think as Councillor uh, Zambuto pointed out, we've agreed with this, what this council asked us to do was to create a, uh, an innovation center, which we've agreed to do in the first phase. Um, we're doing that right up front. It's not easy to do that, I will tell you. That is a loss leader. We will not make money on that building, and it's going to be something that will set the table, we hope, for commercial property. In addition to that, if I could, all the plazas, all of the street, with, with regard to the sewer, Council Rizzo, with all due respect, we're not the people who created the problem. We're not even the people who, is, who are pushing that over the tipping point, but we are the people, the same is true on transportation and all the rest of it, who are being asked to pony up to fix some of these problems. Happy to do it. We are going to be your neighbors. We're going to be here for 20 years. We're going to be doing this for a long time. I'm not asking for sympathy, but what we are suggesting is that people should consider the fact that we're going to be a big engine of growth here. We recognize our responsibility. We didn't create the problems, but we're going to work as hard as we can to fix some of these problems, the ones that we can make work. So with all due respect, um, we have 52 acres and 162 acre project in which you say $2 billion is coming out of the city of Revere as far as development uh, in the aggregate form. Uh, as we just spoke about. Uh, I can only presume, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you've got 520,000 square feet of office space coming online over in Boston uh, from what they purport here no. in the February. We don't have a tenant for that. So we, we, we well, prepared that office space. It's 520,000 square feet of space that we sought the approval for in case Amazon came here. That's Correct. what we tried to do that. Right. We don't have a tenant for that space, so we don't have a schedule to build that space, mm -hmm. period. But, but we have approvals statement. in Boston, yeah and 520 uh, proposed spaces in the event that Amazon came, but they're not coming, correct? Correct. That's the price of doing business. So Happy you've got 8,500 linear feet that are going to be uh, developed as far as roadways in the city of Revere, if I'm not mistaken. I, so You're then, adding 8,000, it's by your document, 8,500 linear square feet of new <laughs> roadway for the city of Revere, right. or is it 5,800? I, I can't remember the exact number. Right, concerned. but it's we're, one we're of the, either five or I'm transposing A lot of water and sewer, a lot of, lot of park mm -hmm. facilities, yes. In the innovation building, your first uh, meeting that you had here was that you were going to do that, period. You, because not, not, this wasn't something that the city asked for. Oh no, Councilor. Not that we, I we remember. Never, we never walk into a room, Councilor, and participate in a meeting unless we get a little feedback before that meeting of what people want, okay? So we didn't walk into this room mm -hmm. cold, as you know, okay? We would have gladly have met with you. Many of the other councillors met with us a number mm -hmm. of times before we walked into that room. And one of the things that came up from the mayor and from the other councillors was, at the get-go, in your first phase, if you could create something that would be similar to what's done in the Seaport District, that mm -hmm. created that innovation center, that set the Seaport in such good motion to get all those jobs going and get all those office buildings built, that kind of thing was what Revere wanted. So I just want to so hear that that's our room, mitigation. When we walked into the, that's one of the things. When we walked into this room, that was one of the most important things that people put on our plate. Thank and you. And we knew it, and that's why we committed to it. Mr. Chairman, may I continue with my questions? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Um, I just have a few more. And, Tom, I'm not sure if this uh, transportation issues would be yours or Doug's. More Doug. Okay. Um, How about that? That was pretty swift, right? You know, yeah. Um, well, my first question is, uh, with the traffic study, and um, it looks like you spent a lot of time and effort uh, studying the traffic patterns, which with a project like this, I would imagine, um, you, know, uh, it, you know, it was a an absolute requirement. Now, did the city do its own traffic study, or are we using uh, HYM's traffic study? So the way the traffic studies work is that we submit a preliminary list of intersections that we're going to study, which was based upon what the casino had studied, which was in the about 40 intersections. We had met with the city of Revere, um, you know, Frank, Bob, his staff, um, uh, city of Boston, Boston Transportation, and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Every city, and I think most of them were actually added in Revere, Revere had requested a number of additional intersections to be studied. Um, so that's number one. Um, so it was our traffic study was put together. I do know the city of Revere is doing its own separate traffic study on Revere Beach Boulevard and Ocean Boulevard, which is, you know, kind of parallel as well. Some of the intersections are actually studied in both reports too as well. Uh, but we do our own intersection study. I do know that also that HYM did put up 
I think over $150,000 early in the process so that the city could actually hire its own peer review consultants. And I do know that Vanessa and Associates was hired uh, by the city to review the traffic study and attend the DAG meetings too as well. Um, the other thing too, going back, is I think one of the councils referenced a lot of projects that were out there. I think, Mr. Uh, Council Rizzo, you mentioned some of these. We are actually required, our traffic study just includes not just our um, traffic, it actually includes all proposed, planned, approved, or proposed projects in Revere and City of Boston. So we actually have over 3 million square feet of other projects between East Boston and Revere that are also planned and proposed that are incorporated into the traffic study. So it is quite comprehensive. Um, and we actually look at it in two different study years, 2028 and 2038, because we are a 20-year project. So there's two different study guidelines. I think the executive summary by itself was 170 pages. Um, out of that was proposed. Correct. Um, um, so off of that, we are proposing over $50 million worth of traffic improvements, the vast majority of which are in Revere, right? And part of that is because there hasn't been a lot of investment by the state in some of these corridors and roadways. Um, and so th this slide here, which was part of you know, our, our um, presentations, but also was more detailed in our traffic study, shows all the intersections that are looking at as improvements, um, and particularly the Winthrop Avenue corridor as well as the Route 1A corridor. Um, so it is quite extensive. So, but, um, but that's just at least my background. So, so my question pertaining to transportation, and as much as we talk transit-oriented, I mean, you don't have to drive very far. You can drive down Ocean Ave, which again is part of a transit-oriented development project, and you'll see cars parked out on Ocean Avenue because uh, they don't want to pay the $100 a month or whatever to park underneath the garage. So these pro you know, projects will come with vehicles. There's no question about that. Uh, and and uh, you know, um, so, you know, so clearly having a solid transportation plan is mandatory. Um, but my one question, you know, and, and I've got several, but this is the one that uh, uh, um, I really couldn't figure out. Maybe you can explain it to me. Like leaving the site, I remember like, you know, and, and somebody had brought up the casino project and, and the traffic studies there, and there was gonna be an exit from that site that would take you from 1A over to Route 16 heading west and then up on up to Route 1 north. And then coming Route 1 south, you were gonna be able to come down and instead of having to go up and make a U-turn around to, so in other words, head 16 west and come back 16 east, you were gonna be able to, you know, hit a signal and then just take an immediate left onto Route 16 heading east from Route 1 south. Now is, I saw something about that and I tried to get my head around it and I couldn't fully understand it. Can you explain that portion of the traffic uh, improvements so that I can have a better grasp on what you're doing there? Yeah, so correct. So Route 16 and Route 1, which I think we might be able to find it, there were three missing movements. So Route 16 and Route 1 is not a fully functioning highway intersection, right? So if you're heading, so, and again, we think that actually puts burden onto Route 1A because people, it's hard to get from Route 1 to Route 16. So you just mentioned one turn. If you're heading on Route 1 southbound, right, today you can get off onto Route 16 heading west. And then you have to go down to Garfield Street, right, to do a U-turn. Right. Which in the morning peak time is basically theoretically probably impossible right. because it's jammed all the way up. Right. Our proposed mitigation is adding three missing movements into that interchange, the one that you just described. So you'll be allowed now to come down Route 1 get into two left-hand turn lanes, there'll be a new signalized intersection right on Route 16 and Route 1 so that you can get off Route 1 and then take an immediate left through um, in a signalized intersection to head on to Route 16 eastbound, which today you can't, well, you can't do because you have to do a U-turn. That means basically you're out of that queue, right? So it means that it's easier to get to Route 16, which is easier potentially to get to the site in this part of Revere. Also, right now, if you're coming in the evening, say, Route 16 eastbound, right, there is no way to get onto Route 1 northbound doesn't exist. There's a second intersection that we actually do, so it has another signalized intersection will allow you to take a left and basically get right on to the highway ramp and takes you onto Route 1 northbound. So will people heading, heading west on 16 coming from Revere or coming from 1A, will they be able to also access one, uh, Route 1 north? Correct. It's, okay, it's that's two, perfect. Two, two missing movements. That's a also, tremendous, that to me is a tremendous improvement. And that, as well, you know, again, you know, as long as the city council is assured that these improvements are going to happen, like that's, that to me is just critical because, you know, we've been, we've been told things before and it just hasn't, you know, this is going back 15 years and, 
you know, uh, so as long as there's something here, and I see Bob O'Brien shaking his head, and he seems to, you know, be convinced that this is is something that we're going to have, uh, you know, solved, then that's going to be uh, good. We have done peer reviews uh, with the city of Boston and with, uh, okay. Um, and uh, one last question I have, Mr. Chairman, and, and, you know, and then that'll be it. And, you know, I know that Tom had said earlier that we're further ahead in Revere than in Boston. And I'm just a little curious as to why we are further ahead in approving this project um, than Boston is. I mean, you know, uh, Councilor Rotundo uh, had alluded to the fact, and, and again, it's through no, there's no fault of HYM, uh, but, you know, linkage payments had been, uh, you know, uh, or, you know, mitigation has been um, part of the package with Boston. And, uh, but again, there's still some due diligence apparently that they're doing and, and uh, more, more review. So I don't know why that we are further ahead right now than the city of Boston would be on a smaller portion of the, the site. Answer's, so. The answer is actually pretty simple. Um, the, um, the DAG process and the project review committee process was very well structured in Revere. And so when we started to work with the mayor's office and with Bob O'Brien and with Frank Stringy uh, beginning last winter, so you recall that we had a, a zoning vote with the council in February of, of uh, this year. Uh, and then immediately sat down to structure a community process that could go through this, you know, uh, this uh, overlay district process. And um, uh, as we did that, the immediate thought between everybody was, okay, the best way to manage the professionals, as Doug pointed out, you know, there were a series of professionals that HYM paid for for the city to hire to review our, our work. The best way to manage those professionals' time as well as the professionals with the city, together with a group uh, of the community from the DAG, was to structure meetings in which we would meet on specific subject matter uh, and go through that process from uh, May, I guess, or June until uh, just recently, you know, in October. And so we did that. The city of Boston, quite frankly, didn't make that decision until later in the summer or into the fall. So we've only just begun that process with the city at City of Boston, maybe maybe. 30 or 45 days ago. We began the process in the spring because honestly, I, I know this may come as a surprise to you, but, but Revere was better managed. Revere was better structured, ready to go. Boston had a lot on their plate and they weren't really ready for us to, you know, to, to manage this process. So it went well. So Boston wasn't uh, engaged in the process, yet they have two thirds of the property there. I, well, that I, seems, here's what I would say, seems I'm not a engaged. Crazy. What I would say is we were engaged in meetings but the meetings weren't engaged in a satisfactory or structured with the, uh, the team there in a satisfactory manner to the community. And so when we came back and we structured it more appropriately for the community, uh, based in part on the structure that the city of Revere put together, it's, you know, it started on a better path. But I, you know, I, I, I've been working in Boston for 25 years, but this was a better structured process, at least in this particular instance. Well, from the developer's point of view, I'm glad it was better structured. I'm more concerned about it from the city's perspective and making sure that our interests are protected. And uh, so I think I think a little trepidation doesn't hurt whatsoever. So I don't fault the city of Boston for that. I think Mayor Walsh is probably, um, you know, uh, uh, taking it slowly because he probably realizes this is going to be something that's going to impact that area forever and that, you know, he wants to be deliberate, and I wouldn't fault him for that. I mean, I'm glad that it's moving along in Revere, and of course we want to see some sort of development down there. We don't want to see it empty uh, with four days of live racing for the next 10 years. You know, we want to see something happen down there. But again, from my perspective, we want to see something that is measured and that is controlled uh, in a way that that the city can absorb whatever impacts that it has to offer. So, you know, I mean, like sailing through is great. I, I, and I and I and I and I I I, uh, I understand that. You know, I mean, time is money. So you don't want to be, you know, meeting for months and months and months and months. But I hope you understand from my perspective that I want to make sure that you know, anything that is ultimately approved, and I'm only one vote on the city council, but anything that's ultimately approved is gonna be looking out for the best interests of every single resident that's already living here. As much as we wanna see and attract people to Revere, uh, you know, I, I, I wanna make sure that our existing residents 
are protected to the extent that I can protect them as one member of the city council. So, you know, um, that was really why I wanted to ask the question to 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 like see why you know what was going on with the city of Boston. But if it, it, you know if they didn't engage till several months later, then you know yeah, that I, kind of explains it. If I may, I mean. First of all, you know, we've been at this for 18 months in Revere, and so I, I certainly don't feel like we're sailing through. I mean, 18 months of really good, solid engagement with the community, I think, is, is an appropriate level of engagement, and 18 months is a fairly long time. So we've been doing this for a while. I would say from the city of Boston, I've you know, obviously... I've you know, seen two-family homes take 18 months in the city of Revere. <laughs> so, I mean, this is, uh, you know... This is a pretty is, long one. Yeah. But, the, but I would say, you know, Mayor Walsh is, uh, has been an outstanding mayor in Boston. We do a tremendous amount of work with Mayor Walsh. We have a deep amount of experience with the BPDA and all the work there. Um, you know, I just think there's a lot on everybody's plate. And so trying to make sure that we, you know, that we structure it well and get, and get through the process, it's just, it's just different. Plus, remember, the process in Boston is different. We, we don't appear, you know, there's, there's different uh, needs in terms of the various community levels. The BPDA has a different process. The, 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 uh, the periods of comment and things like that with the BPDA and their process are a little bit different than Revere. So it's just, you know, it's different communities with different processes. I appreciate all of your uh, time, Tom. I know that, you know, this, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, I, I, you know, I want, I want a good project for Revere. That's what I want. And, you know, that site is a very valuable piece of property. Um, obviously to you, but certainly to the city of Revere. It's been a long-standing member of our community. It goes back over 80 years as a racetrack. I mean, uh, I, for one, you know, uh, you know, was sorry to see after 80 years the thoroughbred racing industry die in all of New England. It's, it, you know, it, you know it, it was tough. I grew up down there in a lot of ways. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, you know, hopefully this is going to be a project that will make the city proud and, and at the end of the day make the city uh, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, one that make the make this project be one that the city can look back on and say, yeah, you know what, we did the right thing there, and that's really uh, all that I could hope for as an elected official. So, I appreciate everything you've done so far, Tom. Well, if I could, Councilor, just I'd like to say thank you. You know, we. Um the team here does a lot of work putting that material together. I know we, we sort of laughed a little bit about the size of the filing, and it is extensive. I mean, I know, you know my partner Doug does a tremendous amount of work putting this together, and we really appreciate it when a public official digs in, reads it, asks us, you know, we, we're not afraid of the hard questions, so we appreciate you asking these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Tom. Ira? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tom, what can I say? Um, a lot of information has been passed tonight. I, I, I even learned a couple of things about the sewer lines and what's going on now. The sewer system, Doug, if I, if I may, where you are is kind of the end of Revere's line. So most of the impact would be down in Beachmont and my area down in Ward 2 and part of Ward 5 down in the Harris Street area. So, you know, it's interesting to hear that that, that will be increased to accept more flow coming from the rest of the city that it goes. And there's also another direction down um, through Green, the Green Street area. So there's another line down there that goes into Chelsea and down through Eastern Ave. So, you know, we're not going to get bogged down, you know, the way it sounds with that new 20-inch line and the, maybe the extra line that we get is going to actually help our flow and stop a lot of the, the uh, SROs that that happened, especially down in Elliott, Elliott Road, that we do need a new line down there. And I know we planned that out a few years ago, but that kind of went by the wayside. But hopefully, you know, with a lot of the mitigation that, you know, you guys bring aboard, that'll be fixed too. Um, what I like about what you folks are doing, more than what happened up in Overlook Ridge, is that you're up front and you're looking outside the box. It's not just Suffolk Downs you're looking at. You're looking at Beachmont Square. You're looking at Standish Road. You're looking at Elliott Road. You're looking about fixing parks up. You're looking about fixing uh, public stairs up. Outside the box that you're not responsible for, even helping us uh, clean out some of the ditches behind Standish Road and Sales Creek. This is what I like about what's going on here. You know, but you know, hopefully not like Overlook Ridge that you know, this will be finished. I know, like I said the other night, you know, by the time this happens, I'll be 93 years old. And, uh, 
but <laughs> I know, I know. Uh, but you know, I'm looking forward to this. You know, you're starting in Revere. There's a lot of mitigate. There is a lot of mitigation. It may not be cash, but it's in other sources. And I'm glad to see that the traffic mitigation, which I'm deeply involved in. I've I visited every DAG meeting that was held, plus even the morning sessions that we had, to know what was going on. The ones that I one that I missed at night. I knew what was going on. I appreciate all that. You, you, you listen to me. You listen to my constituents that had questions that you answer, that you folks answered. You know, and we appreciate that. You know, I'm, I'm ready to move ahead with this. You know, I hope it does come out of committee tonight so we can vote on it next week. And you know, it, it's just we're looking forward to a positive Revere. Looking at $43 million coming into this city is not something to blink at. That's going to help a lot of things. It's going to help our schools. It's going to help our traffic. And thinking of tra speaking of traffic, we all realize the traffic isn't revered traffic, as the council said. It's pass-through traffic. You know, the traffic that's going to come to Revere is going to stay in Revere. It's going to stay at Suffolk Downs. It's going to stay at the 300 units that are being built here, the 200 units built there. Grant, you know, and a lot of those people are going to be using the train. That's the, what the TOD is all about, coming in and using that blue line. So I look forward to all this. I'm not going to ask any questions because a lot of the questions were answered for the last three and a half months that we've been getting together that you can see on Revere TV, you can see on YouTube. Everything's ready to go. I'm ready to go, and I hope the rest of the council makes this ready to go next week. Thank you very much. Council Zambudo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm actually sorry that my colleague uh, uh, had to leave, uh, but he did tell me he had a commitment uh, that he had to make because I, I wanted to compliment him on some of his great questions. And I think we all got a, a good education on the sewer uh, situation and, and, and the mitigation and the improvements that are just going to happen by circumstance of, of facilitating what's going to happen in the future. Uh, now, uh, you talked about the linkage fee in Boston, and maybe that's something we should talk about for future development, and, and that's all well and good. Uh, but my colleague that, that left talked about, you know, why Boston is dragging their feet. I, now, I know this is not your project, but tell, tell me, tell me, I'm, no, I, I'm, I'm kidding, but tell me about, give me an idea how much footage is being built out in, in the Seaport District right at this moment. I don't know, millions, uh, millions of square feet. I, millions, I of, millions of square feet. Yeah. So if Boston's a little preoccupied with the Seaport District, I can see them not making Suffolk down a priority. Uh, I drive by the Seaport every day and, and I see what's going on there. So uh, I am thrilled that we're way ahead in Revere and that the process for us was better. And I take it as it's better for us as a city and you as a developer. And that's the way I see it. Uh, I also see the $50 million innovation building as mitigation. My colleague might not see that and might not think I was interested in it, but I certainly was. And, and I'm thrilled that that's going to be the kickoff of the project in Revere. Um, so again, I don't see the fact that we're way ahead of Boston as a detriment, I see it as a benefit. And, and uh, I'm excited about this project. I know we're gonna vote this out favorably tonight, and we're gonna vote as a city council on Monday uh, and approve this project, and we're gonna get started, and we're gonna see a shovel in the ground before long. So I'm thrilled, and uh, I think, uh, again, I wish my colleague, Councilor Rizzo, was still here because he asked some great questions, and it did give a lot more information uh, that might not have been talked about and, and, and ma made me feel a lot better about some of the infrastructure work, and I'm sure it made some of the uh, people watching this uh, on TV feel a lot better. But uh, uh, I'm thrilled with this project, and uh, let's move forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. O'Brien, uh, I would just like to 
on behalf of the, resi the residents that I represent, uh, once again, uh, implore upon you the, um, the effort that needs to happen with regard to that commuter station at Wonderland. We've just re this city council has just rezoned the NECO property for robotics and high tech. Uh, we, uh, we just cleared the lot at Wonderland. It's gone. It's going to be there for development. And your own project. I mean, what could be better than that commuter stop in back of Wonderland taking all the people from the North Shore so they don't have to drive here over to your project, what would be two blue line stops away? It's, it's just something that uh, would really benefit the city, and I hope you will put every effort into that with your influence with the governor and uh, also uh, uh, Senator Boncori, who is chairman of transportation, as we know, and uh, make that happen for this city. It would be a tremendous improvement. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Councilor, you, and you had already implored us on that, and so we, we're working on that already. That's on our, that's on our, we're working on that. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. O'Brien. I do have a couple more questions, and then I'm going to so come to a vote. Um, my understanding, and, and correct me, uh, the first time that you appeared before the council was what, January 2018, was it? Yeah, I think it was. Uh, 17th. And um, actually, that day I have in front of me the, uh, the actual uh, minutes for that, and it uh, brought up the Beachmont Innovation Center that you uh, presented to us that day. That's why I was kind of, uh, yeah, that's why I was kind of, it's uh, called Beachmont Innovation Square. That's why I was kind of no, I did come, so think because, of that. So here's, a, here's our process, just, just so you know. When, when, we, when we take on a new project, we would never come before the city council just totally green, right? So we, we spent a lot of time with community stakeholders. We we'd already, by the time we came to this, I don't know how many times we had met with Councilor McKenna, just as an example, and, and Councilor Novoselsky, you know, we, I don't know how many times we had met with you. Um, we certainly had, had known our way to the bagel bin, I, I will tell you that. So by the time we got here, okay, um, we had kind of started to formulate what a proposal should look like. We would never come before you and embarrass ourselves and be green and not know what we should propose. We'd also spend a lot of time with the mayor, with Bob and that, with that team. And so when we, yeah, when we started to talk about that, mm -hmm. we knew that that's what this council wanted. So we were seeking to give you what you told us you wanted. So while it's true that was our first council you know, meeting or among our first council meetings, it's because we had done all the spade work necessary to be prepared for that meeting. Okay, so it's based upon their request. Uh, McKenna, Novoselsky, exactly. Thank yeah, you. and I, I yeah. would say a broader That's group right, of people. I'm, I'm just, I mean, I think, relax, Tony. I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I I'm think Councilor Zambudo through. thought it was a good idea. I mean, I, I can't speak for everybody, but I, right. you know, certainly the mayor, I, I think it was, we, just, we didn't come up with it with just one or two conversations. And, you know, just looking at this project um, in its totality, this is the biggest project uh, that will come to the the state in the past. Uh, this is bigger than the casino. No, no, no. Casino is a two I mean, billion dollar one, project. Casino is a one fell swoop. I don't know, three billion dollars or something like yeah. that. You know, listen. But the, uh, over, over a phase out period, this is a yeah, bigger project. I mean, but the casino has been built in what thirty six months or or mm -hmm. whatever that is. You know, it's going to take us twenty years to build this out. You know, the the project in Weymouth is a very large project. I mean, there's a bunch of different Ooh, projects. Seaport. Are, I'm not. A, I'm 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 totally agreeing with you. This is a big project. We uh, recognize very similar to Assembly Row. The only, you know, I mean, very yes. similar. Yes. Uh, as we size, said, functionality, yeah. less the the yes the, the apartment park. Um, the jobs, you say that you're going to have 15,000 jobs. And again, I'm asking questions that were asked of me, so. Sure. Where are they coming from? Well, I mean, you know, we'd love to have as many of them come from people of Revere. That's, you know, as we said, we started to work already with the, right. the mayor's I office mean, to try and prepare people for those jobs. 15,000 sure. jobs is the size of uh, all five UMass uh, Boston campuses. It's literally... Uh, it's it's a huge undertaking. So I'm just trying to figure out: are they coming from like Wayfair? Are they coming from Amazon? Um, Don't know. You, you, I mean, you no, know, no idea at this point. Obviously, at this point, you know the the if we're going to talk about the property tax revenue, those are people who are going to be working in those buildings, obviously, and and that's you know the the. Uh, uh, the revenue generated from those buildings in part creates the the overlay that you that you know that creates the assessment that allows you to to tax those buildings at that level. So there will there will definitely be people working in those buildings. And just uh, for my edification, is there any uh, mitigation to uh, 
the schools or anything of that nature uh, above and beyond the innovation center? No, I think, but we had uh, two former school superintendents who testified at the public hearing uh, last week or two weeks ago um, who talked about the fact that the amount of tax revenue, they, they, I think these, I can't speak for them, but if you go back and look at the minutes from that meeting, I think they, their testimony basically was, well, listen, we're not typically fans of development, but this development which produces this kind of tax revenue and the bondability of it, I think the, the bonding uh, capability of the net amount that we tax allows to something like a half a billion dollars or mm -hmm. so of, of total bonding million. capacity. And that puts, uh, I think, in their judgment, uh, the city of Revere in position to be able to build the long-awaited new high school. So that's that was testified to uh, a week or two ago. Thank you. Does anybody in the audience uh, have any questions? I don't have a question. I just would like to say if you get out Then please come to the podium, Bill. My name is Bill Jackson. I live at uh, 95 Stanton Avenue. I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, Rashid Mugabir. Rashid is the head of Masir, the Moroccan American Connections in Revere. He also worked on the Cultural Day, which was last June. And we're going to have another one this June. Um, in addition to that, he is on the Suffolk Downs Development Advisory Group. Do you know that, Drew? You do? Okay. I'm going to go very quickly because I see people are tired of the meeting, although it hasn't been that long. It's an hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> um, let me just say that I want to congratulate HYM. Mr. O'Brien, because this is a great project for this city. And there's no question about it. It's a good thing for the city. And by the way, I have not heard one person, one that I've spoken to about this, that has said, I don't like it and I don't want it. The um, like I said, there was nobody that, that, that was against it, but uh, there were some concerns that people did have, and they have been discussed tonight. I will briefly go over them with you. Uh, well, first of all is the traffic. You all have heard this over and over and over and over again. I heard somebody mention, and I just want to reiterate or get an answer from somebody, that the people who are going to live in this project, they can take the blue line. I think you mentioned that, Ira. Take the blue line. And they will put double, triple, quadruple the, the trains that are necessary. That's as simple as that. And that's what they will do. Um, by the way, I did want to talk about uh, Shirley Avenue. Shirley Avenue is connected to this project. What the hell am I talking about? First of all, it's one stop, this one uh, subway stop. Shirley Avenue has the potential. It already is the most charming city, I mean, a, a, a street in the city. Those restaurants, the stores, the people that run them. And I understand that the uh, uh, mayor has plans to spend a lot of money to go forward with that. Am I correct on that? Yes? Yes. What are, you, what are you looking at? <laughs> so, um, to me, and, and again, I, I'm just closing with this. And I hope every one of you will support whatever the mayor wants to do to improve that road. It is going to be the most charming road in the city. The people who are going to live up in this, in, in this development we're talking about, 
they take one, one stop, and then they will be going up and down Shirley Avenue. Any questions? Thank you. Hi, John Krasavka, 16 Hazy Avenue, Hazy Street. Um, I just, I just, I'm sorry, I need to ask about the number of condos or apartments. Uh, we hear 3,000 for a year, and I still don't have a number for Boston. Mr. O'Brien? What is the number of apartments in Boston? I was told by a community leader in Boston, anywhere between seven and 10,000. No, not in Boston. No, the um, so in Boston we've got. Go ahead, Doug. Uh, you do all the total number of units over the entire site will range from between seven thousand to ten thousand units, all including both sides, right? So if there's twenty eight hundred, which is the number that we have in our submission for Revere, the balance would be in Boston, and it ranges depending on how much office square footage is built. Now, also just to remind everyone too, ten percent of all housing units will be senior housing. That was a commitment we made to both cities, and it's in both documents, okay? Also, of the balance of that, about 30% is the condominiums, and 60% is rental apartments, too. So just so everyone's clear, too, this is not 100% apartments through all of both sides of the city. It was never meant to be that way. Um, there was something else, too, that we heard pretty clearly from both communities, that they wanted diversity of housing uh, units, too, as well. So I want to reiterate, because many people don't know that. Um, just to confirm, the, the Revere side is all I'm concerned about right now. Of the 2,800, not the 3,000 that you're talking about, 10% will be senior housing, which I knew about. Yep, 10% will be senior housing. And then the balance, which is 90% of the units, is about split one-third condominiums and two-thirds rental apartments. Very okay. well. And, and that is a different piece of information for me. Yep. Yeah, no, and again, it's, again the filing is a bit dense, obviously, at points, but... So that's something we also presented to during the presentations as well, too. Um, but again, that's, that's clear. So it's, because again, I think people were concerned earlier on, too, that this is all just going to be apartments, which is not the case. Thank you. Yep. Does anybody else wish to speak? Name and address. Eric Lampadecchio, 43 Tapley Avenue. I just want to say thank you to HYM and to the City Council for having this meeting tonight. I've attended multiple meetings where these guys have been here. And I continue to learn new things, as Councilor Novoselsky pointed out. Um, I'm particularly excited about the mitigation at Route 16 and Route 1. I take that road every day, and I sit in that traffic, and I know it's terrible. Quick question for you in regards to the access points to the site. Presently, you have the blue line T-stops. But in terms of vehicle access, how many access points do you have, and how many of those are in East Boston? The um, access points in East Boston are, um, I think there's, well, we'll, we'll, we'll go through, yeah. Any interpretation of sewer points? Net benefit of, yeah, ben, net benefit of taxes, Tom gets to talk about. I got to talk about traffic. <laughs> um, so, um, so a couple of things, too. So Thomasella and uh, Route 1A are in Boston, right? And that'll be a fully signalized intersection. Today it's not, right? So today... It's supposed to be a right-in, right-out only, even though people take the illegal left. No one has to admit it, but very dangerous. Um, so that one will be uh, fully signalized, and that is the main entry point in and out of our site. Um, we are also going to be drink, breaking Furlong Drive onto Route 1A. So Furlong Drive, as you know today, which is where the stop and shop and target is, you can go right in or right out, but that's all you can do. That will also be fully signalized. So the goal is to get our traffic back to Route 1A, because as you noted, I mean, or Council Rizzo noted, you know, our hope, not hope, but most of our people will be on the blue line, but there'll still be vehicles that are generated from here. So the goal is to get them on to Route 1A, get them off the local streets, and then also the Route 1 and Route 16 interchange is a very big regional improvement that's very important. Outside of that, we still do have the Thomasella Road entry, um, which is shown here. So we have the Thomasella Drive and Winthrop Avenue, and then we will have a new curb cut, which is at our new Main Street, right, on Winthrop Avenue, where a new intersection goes in. That will also line up with, we're going to work with the MBTA to shift their driveway so it aligns, right? So right now, you know, the MBTA just exit parking lot comes right out onto that street. Um, we do also show a right in, right out, which is a minor road, too, as well. Um, 
which is here. We actually are looking at actually eliminating this based upon comments from the Revere um, City Departments, right? It's only right in and right out, but there's a lot of stuff going on in that intersection right now or close to it. So the idea is that we're just literally adding one new um, uh, roadway onto Winthrop Avenue, which is our new Main Street retail district. Uh, it's meant to be pretty purposeful. So again, main entrance is still us, uh, on, well, for not us, but for Boston, it is, which is what you show here. It's a pretty major intersection here. Furlong Drive is up here. Tom Ocello still exists, and then there's one, there's one here. And then again, this one we're going to be taking out. Don't go too far. Nope. Okay. I get another one. <laughs> so what I'm really driving at is the entry points that you showed on the map, none of them of which connect to Bennington Street. So a lot of that right in, right out is going to funnel through Donnelly Square and Beachmont. Can you speak to those improvements that are going to take place down there? Yeah, so again, again, just going back to again, the goal is to get traffic to back to Route 1A or to Route 16, because that's where the, the regional uh, place is going. We have identified also improvements in Donnelly Square to help that traffic situation too as well. Our goal is actually, again, to get people off of the local streets. Now, there will be our residents or like other local residents that will use Bennington Street, depending on where they're going to. They might be going to Winthrop. They might be going to Belle Isle Marsh. They might go to East Boston, you know. Uh, but the goal is to really keep regional, our regional traffic off of the side streets. I'm just going to drive a little further. I'm sorry. Yes, Can sir. you speak to particulars in Donnelly Square and what those um, areas of improvement that you've identified are? Yep, correct. So, um, so a couple things. Um, and again, I don't think we have a plan for this tonight. But um, so two things. Um, the first one is, as many people know, that some of the MBTA buses currently today stop right under the uh, tracks today, right? And it stops right in the drive lane. It lets people off and picks people up. And basically, it stops all of Winthrop Avenue. It's part of how it enters into Donnelly Square. We actually are giving land on our site for a bus pull-off and working with the MBTA for a bus pull-off on their parking lot, which means the buses don't, will no longer have to get queued right under it and stop. That's number one. Uh, second, I think there's a really crazy left-hand turn out of the Dunkin' Donuts. If you want to try it, you can to go northbound. Uh, we are actually putting in a median, basically, that will prevent that movement. So Dunkin' Donuts will be a right-in, right-out only. Um, also, at Crescent Ave, you may recall is that today, you can come down Crescent Avenue, you can go straight to the T intersection, or you can take the kind of, the, I call it the chute, right? That goes right into basically Donnelly Square, right? Um, which creates a no man's land of several cars intervening. So we've been working with Councilor Joe McKenna on this, where we'd actually close that entrance, right? And so we would bring everyone to the T intersection. So again, this is down in this area here. So instead of here, because I've been here, I mean, maybe you've been here, I've been trying to walk through this just as a pedestrian, and it's a little bit of a, it's a crazy. This is where it should be so that I actually can queue up more appropriately, and it can funnel through better. We will be looking at, obviously, signal timing improvements as well, too, so this all flows through much better. And this is all detailed in our, um, our um, filing, too, as well. Yes, correct, and I, correct, and again, I think so. The idea is to look at both the through movement here as well as through here, so that it works much more efficiently as you go through that intersection. Um, and again, the way this works, just for all these transportation improvements, we will be required to do this upgrade, right? And this is the conceptual plan. This will will be here for several years with the city review as well as um, DCR as well as MassDOT for these improvements. They'll have to be approved. We'll also be coming back to the community for each of these improvements before they're implemented. So none of this will become a surprise. But this gives you a sense of that we're being obligated through the, the decision that this is our intersection that we're required to upgrade as part of our mitigation. And I do want to interrupt you, and I apologize. If, uh, right now, sir, has there been any mitigation from the state uh, at this point from uh, – uh, Jay Ash's office, because looking at what happened over in uh, Assembly Square, uh, Assembly Row, uh, they were given $104 million in mitigation from the state for uh, uh, area uh, transportation issues and so forth, corridor uh, changes, and more importantly, $22 million were uh, bonded out by the city of Somerville and assisted them as well. So where are we with uh, Jay Ash? Well, I, I can't speak directly to any, you know, particular official. We are engaged in a very uh, strong process right now with MassDOT, uh, as well as with the other, you know, transportation agencies, which includes the MBTA and everything else, to go through not only our um, proposals for mitigation and the improvements along the corridor, but other things that might come from that that would be, you know, opportunities that they would bring, better bus service, improvements to the blue line, things like that. So, you know, that those are all processes that we hope to be a catalyst for to get the 
Commonwealth to spend uh, more money and take on more initiatives. So we'll do our part, and our hope is that the Commonwealth will do more. And well. just one more bite at the apple here. Would it be possible that you provide AEDs in all your buildings? Uh, can a, uh, basically they're automatic defibrillators. Oh. Uh, to be quite honest with you, you're going to have uh, uh, an issue with time and getting people uh, to defibrillation is a big thing. Yeah, no, I, and it's I, a I cheap product. I see that quite a bit. I mean, honestly, we're not getting into that granular detail. Point of I, information. Yeah. But I, I, that's Mr. Chairman, didn't you just pro submit a motion and didn't correct it get for passed? all buildings? Yep, yeah, but I just want to. Okay, because I, I believe we approved yep. it. Yep, I just want to make sure that that's uh, done. That's all. We're seeing them a lot more in the office buildings, but, you know, again, we also can consider them for the residential buildings too as well. And especially when you're having, you know, 100 people in a unit. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Sorry, just a follow-up item from uh, one of the points that Councilor Rizzo raised in regards to um, the possibility of us seeing the bull market turn into a bear market. Um, if such a change were to take place, would you see or can you foresee this preventing you from proceeding into another phase of the project? Would this take the shovels out of the ground, so to speak? So, so um, the, we feel very fortunate. Phase, I'm not sure which way to face the, um, um, the, we, we feel very fortunate in that um, our, uh, the investors that we own this site together with are uh, institutional investors. So these are, these are folks who are uh, long-term holders, very deep pockets, and, and good folks who we plan to work on for this, you know, on this site for 20 years or so. Um, as we go forward, you know, certainly this, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. We all have been around for a long time. And so there will be a recession. I mean, sometime in the next 20 years, there will be a recession. And the point is to uh, make sure that you, you know, as you, as you begin a project, make sure that that project is fully financed and ready to go. So as you break ground, fully financed, which is, you know, exactly how we operate on every single one of our projects. I would just say, you know, just kind of um, on the basis of what happened Last time, there was a very terrible recession, obviously, in 2009, 2010, 2011. Um, but I, I would say um, this area, this region, was more resilient than other parts of the country. And, you know, we, we see that the economy has, has actually improved quite a bit even since then in terms of the diversity of the kinds of companies that have been created, the number of jobs that have been created, you know, the who knows what will happen next, who knows what will happen next. But we feel like we're well prepared individually as a, as a project, but we feel like the, the region has, has become better prepared as well. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. My last question, may I please have a copy of that PowerPoint or is that available to the public for all the mitigations that I just saw tonight? If I could just get a copy of that. Thank yeah, you. So uh, we, well, if you give us your information, we can email one to you, but also just so everyone knows that. So we also have our own redevelopment website, suffolkdownsredevelopment.com, which we actually post all of our major presentations. And to be honest, you could probably get lost in there with about eight or 10 presentations, um, but we'll post there as well too. But again, if you give that to us, that would be, we can um, get to you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we move to uh, anybody else wish to speak? With that said, Mr. O'Brien, I truly thank you for your commitment to the city. More importantly, uh, to provide the information that I think the people should have. Um, considering that we're ahead of the game, uh, this isn't so bad, uh, at least in my opinion. I'm sure other people would disagree, but that's the nature of the beast. Uh, that said, uh, Madam President. Uh, Chairman, will we be incorporating the findings and conditions of the project review board? I said, will you be incorporating the findings and conditions of the project review board? Yes, please. Okay. On the Suffolk Downs PUD, subject to the findings and conditions of the project review board dated November 2nd, 2018. Councilor Morabito? Yes. Yes. Councilor Patch? Yes. Yes. Councilor Rizzo is absent. Councilor Zambudo? Yes. Yes. Council President Janino is absent. And Chairman Rotundo? Yes. Yes. The, the Suffolk Downs PUD will be forwarded to the full city council on November 26th. Does anybody else wish to be uh, noted affirmatively? I do, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I also do. Thank you. I will conclude the subcommittee meeting. Thank you very much.